Hello there everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes, my name is Phoenix. On the screen here, we'd like to give a very special thank you to Amelia, The Cryptid Sleeps, Susan Butler, Goth Mama, Samantha Place, and Tommy Girl for providing their requests on the community tab for today's hybrid stories. Also, this will be the last call for September birthdays. Please go over to the community tab and find the post and go ahead and put your birthday there so I can put you in the opening credits. With all of that being said, it is now time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Hybrid Scary Stories. This topic is a mashup of different genres. This video will include Backwoods, Cryptids, Park Rangers, Craigslist, and Mountain Climbing. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. So I've told my friends and family this story, and they just look at me like I'm crazy. I ended up telling my wife when we were moving out of the house that this happened in. I lived in Nevada with my wife in a newly constructed house that was three floors. The master bedroom was on the third floor, and there was no door up to the master floor. It was just open. Like a loft, but it was a full-sized area, not a converted attic or anything of the sort. This is pretty common in Nevada, so that they can squeeze as many thin, taller houses in a lot as possible. Anyway. One night, about a month into moving into the house, we're both asleep. I wake up in the middle of the night at around two to four-ish and see all the way at the other side of the room a little creature, all black. I couldn't make out any features or eyes or anything of the sort, but it was small, maybe two feet tall and had two arms and legs like a person, but was wider and didn't move like a person. It was unnaturally fast, it ran quickly to the edge of the bed, and then I could tell it was looking right at me. I could move, and I very consciously remember thinking, Ugh, I do not have time for this. I remember it peered over the mattress and had a longer nose, but for some reason it was not able or allowed to get on the bed. I watched it for about ten seconds, then was like, all right, if it can't get up, I'm going to roll over. So, I rolled over, and nothing else happened that night. Pretty anticlimactic story, I know. But, that's what happened to me that night. I never saw anything in that house except for that one night. I was definitely awake, and I could move, though, so it was not an episode of sleep paralysis. I've had that once, and that is much worse and terrifying. Just wondering if there's a name for what I saw, or if anyone else has had anything similar happen to them. Back when I was in high school, my friends and I were walking up a steep slope on the back side of Cheyenne Mountain near Colorado Springs. One of my friends had gotten ahead and accidentally set in motion a large, four feet in diameter, rock, which began bounding down the hillside. When I heard the rock, I looked up and saw that it was heading right for me. I was frozen with indecision. Should I jump left or right? When the rock was only about 25 feet from me, it diverted to the left and missed me by about eight feet. I realized that it wouldn't have mattered which way I ran. I would have been at least 15 to 20 feet away and safe no matter which way I went. I vowed to myself never to be frozen like that again. That was the scary incident. This was the weird incident. About 15 days later, I was climbing a Colorado 14er with an English friend of mine. We had wanted to do a particular ridge, but missed the easy entry in the virgin woods. Littered with downed trees, thus hard to move, though. When we reached Timberline, we saw that there was a 70-foot cliff wall that would have to be ascended to reach the ridge. We found a 3-foot chimney, which looked like a good route up, except it was blocked about 40 feet up with a large boulder. It looked like you could squeeze between the boulder, so I started up. 
The rock was somewhat rotten, and I couldn't get any protection in. But it didn't seem to matter, as the chimney was easy climbing and secure. When I reached the boulder, the space behind it wasn't large enough to get through. I couldn't see any way to climb out of the chimney and around the boulder. So, I only got way back in the chimney and, after warning my friend, gently, then strongly, tested the boulder to see how secure it really was by thumping on it with the heel of my hand. I couldn't move it, so I went out and felt the top of the boulder. There was a perfect handheld on top, almost like grasping a ladder rung. Thinking that I had sufficiently tested the boulder, I grabbed the hold and started to hoist myself up. The boulder smoothly started rotating out of the chimney. I hadn't tested it in that direction. I was now leaning backward out of the chimney with a three-foot boulder coming loose just in front of my chest. There was no way I could get back in the chimney in time. My mind flashed back to the incident in high school and I realized that it made no difference which way I jumped, just so long as I did. I said to myself, right. Now, the weird part started. I had no memory of the next few seconds, but found myself holding on to a half an inch thick bending flake, somehow, attached to the rock face nearly ten feet from the chimney, watching the boulder finish rotating out of the chimney, and started to fall. Fearing for my partner, I started yelling, Rock! Rock! as loudly as I could. He had seen the rock start to roll, and I had ducked under a small overhang at the base of the cliff. He was certain that the rock and I were coming down together. Unfortunately, he hadn't seen the missing seconds either. After the rock had bounded down into the valley and the noise stopped, he noticed that my rope still went up. I was hanging on to the flake looking at the rock face that I had decided was unclimbable just seconds before. It took about 15 minutes and some of the hardest climbing I had done to get back into the chimney. We had both had had enough of that ridge, so we went back across the valley and found another one, non-technical, way up. I have often wondered just how I was able to jump so far to a hole that I didn't even know, consciously, was there, and why I didn't remember doing it. It's enough to make me wonder about guardian angels. What doesn't kill you? We were aware of how awe-inspiring and majestic our backyard that is in the North American continent can be. The more time we spend exploring it, the more likely the probability of something fantastically terrifying happening to us becomes. After being raised in a small town in rural Alaska, I went on to become a combat search and rescue operator in the U.S. Air Force. I've been fortunate enough to travel a lot of the world and experience some amazing things. Many of these things were pretty freaking scary, but what follows is the single most terrifying experience of my life. This happened when I was just 13 years of age. Growing up in Alaska meant growing up hunting, fishing, camping, hiking, and just general outdoorsiness. By the time I was 12, I had already killed caribou moose, and a crap ton of small game. I've never killed a bear, though. Alaskan bears are divided into four types, polar, black, brown, and grizzly, with the most dangerous of these being the polar bear. It's often said that if you hear a polar bear growl, it will be one of the last sounds you will ever hear. Food sources are so sparse in the Arctic that it's not uncommon at all for a polar bear to track down and hunt a human. The second most dangerous thing is actually a black bear. Black bears are scavengers and are not above eating carrion. They won't hurt you like a polar bear, but if you stumble upon one, they may kill you and bury you so they can come back later and eat you. Brown and grizzly bears are very similar. They're so familiar, in fact, that for quite a while it was thought that they were the same species. There are some size and anatomical differences, though. The bears that inhabit the interior region of Alaska where I lived were black and brown, being that available food sources in the interior of Alaska are not as protein-rich as they are in the coastal regions, mostly some game and berries, 
interior bears tend to be smaller than their coastal cousins. This diet difference, along with the isolation of island life, has really allowed the bears on the island of Kodiak to become a subspecies of grizzly bear. They are the biggest grizzly bears in the world, some standing over nine feet tall. So, given the choice of bears to hunt, of course the obvious choice is a Kodiak. What's the worst that can happen, right? Obviously, I was not the first person to think hunting a Kodiak was a good idea. It has actually been going on long enough that the bears themselves are in on it. They know the sound of a rifle, and they know that something has been killed. They will absolutely steal your kill from you, if you are not careful. All right, on with the story. So, my dad hired a guide, and we went out on a hunt. After a day or two, we found a good-sized male bear, and we started doing all of the things one must do in order to get the bear in range. It took a while, most of the day in fact, but it finally walked into a clearing between some shrubbery, and it was about 250 meters away. Problem was that between him and us was a steep and rocky ravine that would have to be crossed in order to get to him. Whatever, it's now or never, and I had a shot. Okay. Set up prone. Check. Calm your damn breathing so you can freaking shoot. Check. Kind of. Get the chest in those crosshairs. Check. Fire. Bear falls when he's standing. Who freaking yay. Next step, haul freaking ass down the ravine, across the valley, and up the other side. Who cares what else is around? I just shot a freaking Kodiak grizzly. When I finally climbed the ridge on the other side of the ravine and getting to the clearing where the bear is, I immediately set my rifle down and start inspecting him. No sooner do I kneel down next to him than I hear a loud growl and look up to see another bear leaping over the brush that's maybe 15 meters away with me in his sights. This is it. The end. I know my life is over. I don't even remember the conscious thought I had, but... Thankfully, something made me grab my sidearm and blast away at this monster that is barreling down on me. Six slugs from my forty-four mag to the chest, and he slumped onto his face and slid in towards me like a drunken baseball player sliding into home, face first. I pissed myself. Literally. Almost as soon as the second bear stopped moving, my dad and the guide came scrambling through the woods, no doubt thinking the worst after hearing the gunfire. They see two dead bears laying there, and me standing there, looking dead with piss-soaked pants. The guide said we would contact DEC and claim the second kill as self-defense, and we would keep hunting for one for my dad, or I could give him the second bear and we call it a day. Thankfully, my dad chose option B. I had zero desire to see another bear up close and personal ever again. We think in retrospect that we had actually been tracking two bears all along, as they were both very similar. They were mostly adolescent males that hadn't gone their separate ways yet. So I survived. What hadn't killed me had I guessed made me stronger. Or did it? I don't know for sure. I've never gone bear hunting again, and I had no desire to ever again. I did learn three things that day, though. I'll never hunt with a sidearm. There is nothing in North America that can't be killed with a Browning Bar Mark II and 300 when mag. And what doesn't kill you may keep trying. Stay frosty, my friends. I'll start this off by saying I grew up completely, 100% adamant that the paranormal isn't real can all be rationalized and that people who believed in it haven't thought about it hard enough. I've posted about this on social media about paranormal events that have happened in my life recently that have completely changed my mind, primarily about my neighbor's house. That's not what I'll be talking about today, though. I live in the Midwest. I live on a small rural lot between a cornfield and a small forest in a camper. I've lived in this country my entire life. I know the entire county like the back of my hand. This being said, I've come to the conclusion that my experiences around the rural and wooded parts of this county are crawlers. I'm 100% sure of that. 
I've had many encounters, actually. None back to back, but they happened frequently. There is a forest in the middle of the town. I always hated at night since I was little. As I got older, my cousin and I thought getting scared was really fun. We'd go there at night on purpose, but never lasted long. I always felt like I was being watched. This, on top of urban legends of people going missing here at night, made me feel really uneasy. Fast forward to a few years ago. I got married and am getting settled into my life as a husband. I'd take my large, all-black German shepherd, Fenrir, on walks with me at night. I always walk towards the park, but I usually don't enter it. The first time something weird happened was five years ago. I was walking Fenrir and the woods to the front and to the right of me. To the left and behind me was a neighborhood edge and a small playground. Went silent. My dog started acting super anxious. He's usually a very stoic and quiet dog. He's 120 pounds and built like a tank. Looks very intimidating, and he knows it. I heard rustling in the woods, following me, and I felt like I was being stalked. I ran home, and that's the end of the first encounter. I had a few more encounters just like that, but last year things really amped up. I was on a walk at around 11.30 with Fenrir, my wife, and our little newer dog, Booger. He's a terrier chihuahua mix. We all walked down the same path and about three blocks away from the woods. Four or so deer are sprinting out of the trees into the street, towards us, and they seem terrified. Then, I hear what I can only describe as what sounded like a human trying to mimic the sounds of a monkey. I thought it was really silly until recently, when I read that other guy's story who heard the same freaking thing. We laughed it off as some kids playing around. Once we get to the woods and are walking parallel, we can clearly see two reflective eyes and a silhouette staring us down from the tree line. We also heard a deep growl, and then like a hissing sound of sorts, but it wasn't super high-pitched or anything. Both of our dogs acknowledged this as well. Finn stared and Booger growled a bit. I made a Facebook post on the community's Facebook group, and other people told similar stories around town. Around this time, I got a job as a tour guide and maintenance for Rail Explorers. I'm working there again this year as well. We start April 1st. Basically, they take unused or tour-specific railroad sections that aren't used federally, and they have these pedal carts with motor assist on them you can use to explore the tracks. It's super cool and super fun. The one I work at is like five minutes from where I live, and it goes through the woods and in an inaccessible part of the county, unless you float down the river and hike up steep, loose dirt hills. You go under one old car bridge, and you go over two multi-hundred-foot-length old trail bridges. The first one is larger and taller, and it's about 150 feet off the ground above the forest. The second goes over the river, about six months into the job, and it's fall. We work until midnight sometimes, with the last tour leaving at around 9 p.m. That means the last four of the last two months of the year are in complete darkness. The way that job operates is with six employees. Four get on the lead bike and two on the rear bike. From the lead bike, we drop off one person at the busy intersection so they can flag traffic, and one person gets dropped off at the large train bridge that goes over the woods. The person on the bridge gives a short safety speech to the customers, who stop and go one at a time over the bridge. The employee carts are much faster than the customer ones. We all have walkie-talkies, and we usually have these battery-powered floodlights on stands that we use so the customers can see us and light up safety vests. On one particular night, we were behind by 20 or so minutes. Instead of leaving the depot at sunset, we are leaving at dusk. I was stationed at the high bridge. By the time we reached the bridge, it was pitch black, aside from the stars providing a little light. My coworkers dropped me off and waited with me until the first customer arrived. I gave the little speech to the first car of four. I chatted with them a bit. I was trying to buy some time and wait for the next customer cart, so there wasn't a massive gap for my coworkers, who have to flip the bikes around. After a few minutes, I let these customers leave, and I was alone. I was alone for 20 minutes, 
I used the radio so many times, but it was static for everybody. It was one of the only times we had ever had an issue like that as well. I kept seeing movement in the tree line. I kept hearing fast footsteps all around me in every direction. I had the floodlight on behind my head so everybody and everything could see me, but I couldn't see shit. I turned off the floodlight and used my personal flashlight. I kept seeing quick glimpses of pale skin move quickly, but right when I started seeing stuff, I could hear the next customer card coming close, so I turned the light back on and waited for them to come around the corner. When they pulled up, I noticed they had a little boy with them, and he's scared of the dark. I'm terrified at this point, but have to act appropriate, even more so because of this boy. I do not want to scare him. As I'm finishing my speech, I hear movement right behind me and say, Jesus effing Christ, and spin around with my flashlight on instinct. That poor kid. I told them it was probably just a deer and they are good to go across the bridge. That same night, the person stationed at the intersection, this isn't like an in-town intersection, as it's very rural. It's right next to a massive cornfield. He's Native American and was very in tune with his culture. He told me privately a few weeks later that he heard rustling in the cornfield and whatever was out there was whispering his name and trying to get him into the field. He was also without communication for those 20 minutes, but he wasn't in the woods and could see a lot better than I can. Another time, me and that same coworker were headed back on the front cart. We were way ahead, so we stopped the cart in the middle of the high bridge. It sounds scary, I'm a bit afraid of heights, and the bridge has massive gaps between the planks you could fit right through. But after doing it so often, you get used to it. It was a clear night, and we were watching the stars and having small talk. Then, it goes silent. We are a hundred and so feet in the air above the woods. We can hear for miles. The dogs barking across the river two miles can be heard without even seeing the houses. We hear what sounds like a human mimicking a monkey voice, and we hear growling. He looks at me completely seriously and tells me in a stern tone that we need to get out of there right now. I drive the hell out of there, and he moves states to Nevada shortly after this. A few other things happened here and there, and to co-workers as well. Each of my co-workers have at least one story. I'm only sharing mine. Otherwise, it'd be too long. A few months go by, and it's late fall, around the middle of November. I drive through that park in town a lot when I just want to go for a drive. I had my dog, Finn, with me, and it's around 2 a.m. I can't sleep, so I'm listening to a Melvin's CD and driving leisurely through the park. As soon as I get past the entrance gates... I feel really uneasy and weird. I'm not easily scared. Going to that park at night makes me feel a primal fear. It's beyond fight or flight. I had never felt that way in my life anywhere else, ever. And I feel it every time I'm there. I'm driving through the park and I've rolled the windows up a lot more. Finn can still poke his head out, but he can't leap out. As I go deeper into the woods, I feel worse and worse. I decided not to turn around because I'm already past the halfway point. Turning around would make me stay in the woods a lot longer. I started speeding where there weren't turns I couldn't see around. I round the last corner, and what I saw made me have nightmares for months. There was a pale, skinny humanoid. Tall and lanky. Not quite human. Freaking crawling on its hands and feet. But it was crawling... Fast as hell. 20 miles per hour type shit. We don't have bears there. The only animal that size are large humans and deer. That wasn't a deer. It went from my right, crossed the street, and went into the tree line. Finn saw it too. He doesn't bark at animals. Not even other dogs. He went ballistic. He was trying to force himself out of the small gap in the window, nearly foaming at the mouth and snarling. He never, ever acts like that. I'm a certified dog trainer, and I've raised him from birth. Most recently, I've become obsessed with this park. I've walked there at night from my camper to the park with Ben. 
I'll never do it again. I didn't see a figure this time. As I was entering the park, a massive owl flew over my head, so close I could smack it mid-flight. This made me feel weird for some reason. As soon as I got into the park, I felt extremely weird, anxious, and nauseous. I walk a few hundred yards to the only streetlight in the entire park, and I turn around and face the woods. Me and Finn stand there, frozen, for like ten minutes. The silence was deafening. Anytime I heard anything, I jumped. Finn was anxious as hell, too. He kept staring into a certain spot in the woods a ways off. I swear I saw eyes in there every once in a while. I built up the courage to walk out, and I haven't gone back since. It'll still be interesting to see what happened at my job this year. I wanted to add that the county I live in is packed full of abandoned mines. Hundreds of them. I was in the Gila wilderness, and a convoy of us campers and fishers were making the drive on the dirt road from Mongolian to Snow Lake when we spotted a forest ranger guy pulled over, looking in a ditch. Turned out some idiot tried to make a U-turn and didn't realize the loose rocks made it hard to stop. They went over the edge and high centered. We're miles from the nearest official campground, and it's early spring, and the nighttime gets pretty damn cold. We get a jeep with a winch in position and start to pull the guy out of the ditch. Off a hill comes a white dude in a purple velvet sweatsuit. He's got a walking stick, fanny pack, and the purple velvet sweatsuit. That's it. He's a blonde dude and pretty skinny. He comes up to us and he tells us he's German and having a great time. We would not go over the purple velvet suit. It was a real pimp sweatsuit. The ranger is immediately suspicious wants to know where he's staying and where he came from. It was around nine in the morning, and the only way he could have gotten where he came from was to hike for hours. The German guy is a really goofy character and just points off toward the other mountain when asked where he's staying and going. We all think it's funny and also question how the guy is getting along with no water and no food. The sun is intense above 5,000 feet even if it's only 75 degrees. The German guy refuses water or any other help, and he just crosses the road, goes off into the woods. The ranger guy told us he can't really keep the guy from doing that since he seemed okay. He said he'd check a few campsites in that direction later to see if he made it. We get to Snow Lake and commence drinking like fish in order to better catch fish. That evening, the ranger pops by to tell us that nobody at any other camp had seen the dude. He radioed around and no other rangers had abandoned camps or missing campers, and they surely hadn't seen a German dude in a purple pimp sweatsuit, but makes for a good story. German tourists are different. I was doing some stuff in Death Valley a couple of summers ago and left via the opposite direction of the construction crew, so this is a second-hand story. As we were all leaving after a very long night of pouring concrete, they should have been done at sunrise, but things don't finish up until like 1 p.m. or so, the archaeologist, let's just call him Art for the story, saw a faint glimmer of silver in a bush, thinking that it was an old balloon. A huge problem. Don't release balloons. They always come down somewhere and end up as litter. He turned around to retrieve it. Instead, he found a German man sitting there under one of those car windshield sunscreen things with a piece of rolling luggage by his side. This was an area that was closed off to the public until the road was repaired, and nobody would be back through until the next day so he stopped to talk to the man. Apparently, the German man, Claus is a good German name, let's just use that, had been dropped off by his wife and mother-in-law the afternoon before and was in the middle of a long hike, like 20 or 30 miles or so. He had been hiking all night and was taking a break to rest during the day. There were plans to meet up in a day or two, but the women were in Vegas at the casinos. 
After some discussion, Art learned that Claus had no food or supplies and had only drank a few sips from one of his three one-half water bottles since he began the trek. He thought rationing it would be the best since he only had a small amount of water. The temperature was already in the 120 degree Fahrenheit range, and Art had to explain that the guy could not stay there, or he would very literally die. Claus said that he would be fine because he trained by sitting in a sauna a number of times before he left Germany. Plus, how would his wife know where to pick him up at if they left? After explaining the difference between sitting in a sauna and hiking with no food in a dry desert, Art proceeded to question what would happen if his wife's car broke down or if she got delayed for some reason. There's no phone service in the part of the park and nobody was supposed to be in the area to begin with. So, Claus would be SOL if his wife didn't arrive. Claus finally agreed to jump into Art's truck and drive him to the nearby town, which was roughly under 20 miles away. As soon as he got into the AC of the truck and took a few sips of cool water, Claus realized how hot his body actually was and that he was actually in pretty bad shape. When they got to the town, they actually met Claus's wife and mother-in-law in the parking lot of the gas station. It turns out that they broke down there and never made it to Vegas. After talking a little bit, Art had to get off to sleep. He had been up all night and reminded Claus to grab his roller suitcase from the back of the truck. Art casually asked what was inside and Claus opened it to reveal a suitcase full of water bottles. Claus was so delirious from that that he forgot the heavy bag that he had somehow been rolling across the desert was full of water. Delirium like that is a sign of sunstroke. Claus probably wouldn't have made it through the rest of the day had Art not insisted on him getting into the truck. So, my great-grandpa fought in World War II. He was drafted in 1943 when he was just 23. He's 103 years old now. Just a few days ago, he told me a story that he says was the most horrifying experience in his life. I asked him if it was about Japanese soldiers because those guys were vicious back in the day. He told me, no, it was something else. I don't know if this story is true or not, but it did give me chills. Feel free to debunk this if you want. He said that nobody ever believed his story, but he still remembers it clear as day, and it still gives him nightmares to this day. Okay, so this is the story. In 1943, he was stationed in the Philippines, along with others, to hold off the Japanese. However, one day, he and his friend Samuel who unfortunately passed away decades ago, got separated from their platoon. They were in a province making their way through the forest within the mountain area when they both got lost and separated. Gigi, aka great grandfather, forgot what province it was, but he said there were a lot of forests and villages. So he and Samuel were looking around and calling out for their comrades. So they ventured deeper and deeper until they reached the end of the forest. I asked him, why didn't you just radio your platoon? He told me that they did, but for some unknown reason, the communications were scrambled and unintelligible. It concerned both him and Samuel, but Samuel said that they needed to keep calm and tread carefully in case they run into any Japanese soldiers. So they both made it out of the forest, but then they noticed that the sun was about to set. Gigi told Samuel that they needed to set up a camp, and Samuel agreed. That's when Gigi noticed something was off in the distance. It was a small wooden hut. They both decided to camp inside, so they made their way over to the hut. They knocked on the door and checked the place, but there was no sign of people anywhere. But there were clothing scattered around the place. Gigi says that maybe they fled in panic, to which Samuel agreed with him. So, Gigi and Samuel set up camp and ate dinner. Samuel proposed the idea of taking shifts throughout the night to keep a lookout just in case they get shagged in their sleep by the Japanese. Gigi agreed to the idea. So they both woke each other up and took each place as a lookout while the other person slept. 
While Gigi was sleeping, Samuel abruptly woke him up and told him, I spotted movement. Gigi quickly grabbed his rifle and asked him where. Samuel gave the binoculars to Grandpa and pointed to the direction. I saw them in the field, 300 yards away, Samuel said. Gigi looked through the binoculars in the direction Samuel pointed at. At first, he didn't see anything, but then he spotted something moving in the dark. However, when Gigi looked closer, it was just a wild boar. It's just a pig, Grandpa told Samuel. Samuel took the binoculars to see for himself. That's weird. It's just standing there, Samuel said. Grandpa looked at Samuel in confusion and asked what he meant. Samuel then said that the boar wasn't moving or anything. It was just standing there staring at them from afar and that it was starting to weird him out. Grandpa just laughed it off and told Samuel that it was probably just his mind playing tricks on him. But then something odd happened. The oil lamp that served as their source of light inside the hut started to slowly go out. Grandpa went over to light it back up, then afterward went back to his sleeping bag. But then the light suddenly went out yet again. Gigi checked up on it again, thinking that the oil probably ran out. But the strange thing was that there was still plenty of oil. Gigi lit it back up again and went back to sleep. But then the flame went out yet again. That's when a terrified Samuel frantically went up to him and said, It's gone. The hell are you talking about? Gigi asked him. The pig, it just disappeared into thin air. At this point, Grandpa was also starting to get freaked out. Gigi then asked him to explain. Samuel said that he was watching the boar through the binoculars when it suddenly just vanished out of existence. Suddenly, a loud thud came from above them, as if something landed on the roof. Gigi and Samuel grabbed their rifles. We need to get the hell out of here, Samuel said. Grandpa said the rest of the events that happened are said to be one of the worst nightmares in his entire life. Gigi told Samuel not to panic, to lay low and to stay quiet. And so they did, while tightly gripping their guns close. After a few moments of silence, Samuel started screaming. Grandpa turned on his light and saw something straight out of a horror movie. Something that looked like a tongue was lodged into Samuel's neck. His friend was screaming in pain, trying to remove it from his neck. Gigi snapped out of his shock and shot at the ceiling multiple times, trying to hit whatever the tongue belonged to. After a few more shots, the tongue released Samuel and slowly retracted back into the hole on the ceiling. Samuel was gripping the side of his neck tightly while screaming. Blood trickled down his neck. Grandpa put a cloth against the wound and told him to put pressure on it. Afterwards, they collected all their things and exited the cabin and made a break for it. Grandpa turned around and shined his light onto the hut's roof. And what he saw? He described it as a most evil-looking and ugliest thing he has ever seen. I asked him to describe what it looked like. It was humanoid. It had two gigantic wings that were bigger than its own body. The wings looked like a combination of a bats and hawks. Its eyes were blood red and glowed in the dark, skin black as coal, wild unkempt hair, and huge fangs that were visible even though its mouth was closed. It was just perching on the roof staring at them. Grandpa acted quickly. He raised his rifle and began shooting at the thing, unloading all the rounds in his gun's chamber. Samuel also did the same thing. But, to their astonishment, the monster was unfazed. It just continued to stare at them, unbothered. At this point, Grandpa and Samuel started screaming like maniacs while running for the hills. By some miracle, the creature did not pursue them. They were both so scared that they didn't care if they ran into the enemy, as long as they didn't encounter that thing again. They managed to make it till morning and came across a small village where they rested in. That's when they learned from one of the locals that what attacked them was called a Aswang, and that they were very common in the countryside. The locals told them that they were in God's favor because they survived. After a couple of days, they were eventually reunited with their platoon. When they told the story, only a few believed them, 
while the others thought that they probably were drunk and ran into enemy gunfire, hence the injury on Samuel's neck. After the war ended, they all went home, but he could never forget that terrifying encounter that gave him severe PTSD. Samuel, unfortunately, passed away in the 80s due to a stroke. His story honestly freaked me out as well. I just spent the past hour googling Aswangs. What are y'all's thoughts on this? I stayed at a lovely Airbnb in Iowa for my little brother's graduation. He didn't know I was going to make it, so we threw a surprise party at the Airbnb. While we were setting up, my other brother and I went down to the basement to get an extra table. The second we got down there, we looked at each other and said, Yep, it's scary here. The longer I spent in the basement, the greater the feeling of dread grew in me. We found the extra table and headed back upstairs, joking about how creepy a seemingly normal basement was. While we were celebrating, my girlfriend decided she'd run the washer, which was downstairs. She asked me to go with her, since it was creepy. Again, I went down and rushed to leave. The basement was now officially scary to me. Afterwards, my girlfriend and I were relaxing when the laundry buzzer went off. I looked at her, and she said she didn't pick up the load from earlier. I thought it was strange that it hadn't beat hours ago. We headed down to the basement. Again, she stopped at the stairs to the basement and asked me to go first. As I was going down, the buzzer on the washer went off again, scaring us both. We both jumped. I hurried down and grabbed the laundry, and we headed upstairs to let it air dry. I should mention this was an oldish house. So, the stairs were steep, and the bedroom where we slept was probably originally an attic. In order to turn the lights on upstairs, you had to flip a switch at the bottom of the stairs. When I flipped on the switch and headed for the stairs, I heard a loud banging sound, like the sound of pots or something metallic, clanging. I began to go for the kitchen, where there was a knife. But, then I heard the metallic whacking again at the top of the stairs. I turned to look against the now illuminated attic and saw a ceiling fan turned on to its max setting, and its mounting pole was making the sound. I ran upstairs and turned off the fan. We got ready for bed. I had dreams of seeing a shadow figure out on the lawn. I woke up to the next morning tired. I made my way to the kitchen to brew some coffee. As I was turning around, I looked at the staircase to the basement. Something was wrong, and I don't know why but I was drawn to the basement again. I looked down the stairs and walked down. I looked around and saw nothing. We had breakfast, packed our bags, and got ready to go. As we were doing one last sweep, I checked the kitchen one more time to make sure everything was in good shape. Just as I was about to say, all good, let's go, that damn laundry machine buzzed. Both me and my girlfriend were just like, nope, and proceeded to get the hell out. As we were leaving in a rush, I grabbed the bags and told my girlfriend to start the car. As I was leaving, the fan upstairs turned on again and began making the whacking noise. I've never bolted so fast out of a house in all my life. I text the Airbnb host that the washer kept on making noises and that I couldn't figure out how to turn off the ceiling fan upstairs. They message back, thank you for staying with us. Once, when I was a few years younger than I am now, I was selling a lot of items my daughter brought home from college she no longer needed. One item was a microwave in great condition. I already had one, so decided to sell this one online. I've often used Craigslist without any problems, so of course I'm not thinking of any dangers that could arise. Well, I soon put myself in a pretty dangerous position. A man, he sounded young called inquiring about the microwave. I seriously wanted someone to pick it up, but he said he was taking care of a sick father and couldn't leave him, but really needed that microwave. He told me where he lived, which really wasn't very far from me, an apartment building in a side of town that was relatively safe, so I agreed to take it to him. 
Once I arrived to the building, he asked if I could bring it up. I said no, it was too heavy. He said he could not leave the apartment. I was going to have to bring it up. Well, at this point, I just wanted the money and to leave, so I agreed to that. And there I went, heading up a flight of stairs. Luckily, it wasn't one of those very large ones, but still, it was an inconvenience to me. Once I got to his apartment door, I saw him. A man in his mid to late thirties, standing there with shorts and a muscle shirt on. Behind him were lots of barbells and weights for bodybuilding. He was in magnificent shape with huge muscles. He said, Oh, please, set it down there, motioning to the kitchen counter. Okay. That required I entered the room, which immediately I felt uncomfortable with. He then proceeded to inform me that actually he couldn't come for the microwave because he was on house arrest after serving 15 years in prison. I had parked beyond his permanent perimeters and couldn't make it to my car. All I felt was every ounce of blood run out of my body at that moment, or so it seemed that way. He was, in fact, alone. There was no one that he was caring for. He just lied to me about that to get me up here, and now I'm alone in his apartment with a felon right out of prison who would snap my neck like a twig if he should even think about it. I mumbled something like, Okay, well, here you go. Delivered slowly inching my way toward the door. He said, hold on, let me get you your money. I went to the other room, just quick enough to retrieve it. I almost ran out, but I had a strange feeling that I shouldn't do that. Just remain calm and act like all is okay, and then leave ASAP. He handed me the money, then started to chit-chat a bit. I listened for a sec, and I get to the door somehow. When I turned to leave, he quickly said, Oh, it won't turn on. How do you work it? Can you show me? So I had to turn around and go back in, terrified but trying not to look terrified. Somehow I kept my cool and said, Oh, you just press this, this and that. And to my great relief, it came on and he chuckled, saying he was not good with appliances. Okay, so he was being nice, but something just felt off. I made it back to the door and almost ran to the stairs, but forced myself to walk slow as not to alarm him. I feel like if I did, it would make him mad. I heard an uncomfortable laugh behind me. I didn't turn around to engage. I just kept walking down those stairs till I was at the bottom and could breathe again. I soon saw other people and felt better. What was I thinking? I couldn't believe I had placed myself in that position. Sure, he didn't do anything physical to me, but he did lie to get me there. What else was he capable of? When I think of all the possible scenarios that could have gone down had I not been cool-headed, I think he may have attacked me, and who would know? Not a soul. I hadn't told anyone from home where I was going. Yes, I'd be missed and probably for days, maybe even months, been found, if ever. To this day, I still get this scared feeling in my gut just thinking about what could have happened to me if I had been taken by surprise while alone with this man. Never again. Never, ever again. Good day, friends. I recently told a friend about something I experienced as a kid, and they told me I should share it with you. So here's the story. When I was young, I lived on a farm with my family that had some pretty freaky urban legends attached to it, even to the point that a lot of my indigenous family refused to visit out of fear. How the story goes is there was an evil creature that lived at the bottom of the hill and came out at night to torment and play tricks on people. I never believed in that stuff, even as a kid, but one night I started having vivid, almost real feeling nightmares about being chased by it around the property that got so bad it ended up putting me into therapy. After a year of being haunted by this thing, I tried to tell my family that I wanted to move because of how real these nightmares were, but they just thought I had a wild imagination. It wasn't only the nightmares that had made this so horrifying, though. Some days we'd find ravaged 
chickens and other days goats would be missing. I've had friends stay over and never come back, and sometimes, late at night, we'd hear something chasing our horse in the field, and she would go crazy and scream until the early hours of the morning. Me and my sister started to believe that this thing was very real. One day, a friend of the family's came to visit and stayed in the cabin down the back of the property, which was the first night I'd managed to have a proper sleep in months. That night, the friend of the parents had the worst nightmares he's ever had and left early the next day and never came back to visit. He said as he was packing that something was chasing him in his dreams, and when he woke, he heard the muffled crying outside of the cabin, and it was shaking as if something was hitting the side of the building with full force. The look of fear on that man's face still haunts me to this day. The man was shaking and crying as he drove away, and my parents refused to talk with us about it. Later on that day, my sister and I walked down to the cabin to find it was on a lean, and the inside looked like it had been hit with an earthquake. My parents sold the farm and moved away a couple of months after that. I never had those nightmares again. A few years later, my siblings and I were sent an article about the farm and a murder-suicide that happened after the husband that bought the property went insane, stabbed his wife to death, and then shot himself in the head. My parents refused to talk about it, but sometimes my siblings and cousins bring it up in conversation, sharing the trauma it caused us and our friends that refused to come back after the horrible night terrors they experienced there. That entire town is screwed. Everyone that leaves that township has a traumatizing story that is either logic-based or supernatural. So, many terrible things have happened there, so I wouldn't be surprised if there's something more sinister living on that land. If you want to go down a depressing wormhole, look up the Bowerville murders. It's our very own little Australian version of Derry. I'm not sure if the whole thing was in my mind or a real horror story, but after finding out about the murder that happened a couple of years later, I'm starting to believe that this thing is still there and entering people's nightmares, butchering the local wildlife and terrorizing whoever buys up that land. Fuck, that was traumatic to write. Sorry it's not my best work, but there's too much attached to it that I don't want to dive deeper into. Thank you for listening to my story. One of the scariest moments I've had on a mountain happened at Camp 1, or C1, on Everest in 2012 when I watched the biggest avalanche I'd ever seen fill the western CWM and come barreling towards me. It was mid-morning on a gloriously sunny Himalayan day, the kind where the sky is the deepest blue. I had just arrived at C1 after carrying a load up from base camp and I knew I would have at least two hours to relax before the rest of my team arrived. The sun shone down and reflected off every surface of the CWM, making my tent warm and toasty. My thermometer was showing 30 degrees Celsius. I took off my boots, gloves, down jackets, and trousers. I opened both doors at the front and back of the tent to allow the cool breeze to blow through and settle down for a cozy nap. You hear a lot of avalanches when you're climbing on Everest. Sometimes they make good photos if you're quick, but they very rarely, this is 2012, come near the camps. Suddenly, I heard an almighty whomp, a sound of enormous bass and volume. This was clearly a bigger avalanche than usual. I thought I might get a good picture, so despite my snuggled warmth, I sprung quickly to my knees and looked out of the tent of the valley towards the nut's face, where the sound had come from. To my amazement, there was a simply massive avalanche tumbling down the near vertical mile-high nut's face. I watched as it reached the valley floor and turned towards me, mushrooming out to be a quarter of a mile wide. My amazement at this incredible sight turned to stone-cold fear as I suddenly realized that I was dead center in its path. It was hundreds of meters wide, hundreds of meters high, and still growing. It wasn't going to stop before it got to me. It was going to steamroll right over me. 
I knew it would hit me in seconds. I didn't have the right clothing on. I didn't even have boots on. I was about to get swept up in a millstorm of snow and ice in my socks and thermal underwear. I didn't have time to put anything on, grab anything, or even get out of the tent. What did I have time to do? I knew I must act. I must do something. The only thing I could think of was to zip up the tent door. Now, I'm sure you're laughing at the idea because we all know that a million tons of snow and ice will not be repelled by a zipped tent door. But it gets worse. What always happens when you try to close a zipper in a hurry? Yes, the zipper got stuck. The avalanche was almost upon me. I couldn't see the sky, just a towering, churning, massive cloud, only meters from me. So I did the next best thing to zipping up the tent door. I held it in the closed position. The avalanche hit. I was instantly thrown backwards across the tent, pushing me down to the floor and covered by a raging torrent of wind, snow, and ice crystals. I was suffocating. My mouth was full of snow. My nose, ears, and eyes were packed with snow and I was being beaten like I was in the rapids of a raging river. I kept trying to push myself to my hands and knees to make space above the drifting snow to breathe, but I kept getting hammered back down. The fear was gone now. Emotionless action was all I could manage. I told myself that I was probably going to die, but that I should keep fighting until the end. I kept trying to get clear of the snow, kept fighting to breathe, Slowly, the rage abated, and suddenly it stopped. I found myself on my hands and knees, still in my tent, with Sprindrift hissing through it. I crawled out to desolation. Around me, all the other tents were either gone, whipped over the ice ball, and buried forever, or broken, shredded, worthless hulks. The sun was out, and all was quiet, save the hissing Spindrift and some distant cries from other climbers who had survived and were looking for each other. I survived because I had both doors of my tent open. The avalanche was able to pass through my tent. If I had even one door closed, I believe my tent and I would have been picked up and thrown into the greatest crevices of the Kumbu Icefall. I knew I had to dig my tent out before the sun melted the two feet of snow that had been left inside of it. I also had to find my boots and clothes, but I had survived. The next day, I was able to view the debris field of the avalanche. There were chunks of ice the size of small houses, down to the size of a leaf of bread strewn all over the valley floor, half a mile wide and a couple of miles long. Amazingly, the large ice chunks all settled out of the churning avalanche before it hit me. Any one of those chunks, big or small, would have killed me instantly. But the closest one to my tent, the size of a small car, was about 50 meters away. I was hit by wind, snow, and crushed ice. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true hybrid scary stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes and also the gifted membership. Donna, Nat Davies, a.k.a. Goth Mama, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Chrissy Elias, Denise S., Tina Mee, Tammy Slayton, Mrs. Enerscare, Doba Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Amy Klimko, Sugared Spite, and Anita B. Thank you all so much for continuing to remain the pillars of this channel, as I've said time and time again. I deeply appreciate each and every one of you. Now, on to our gifted memberships. The Conspiracy Archives, Grimm's Library, Adam Grigg, and The Cryptid Sleeps. Thank you all so much for your continued support. I appreciate it. To the subscribers and just random listeners, thank you for stopping by and also listening to this video. It really does help the channel out, for without you... I would not have a voice. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.